Well, I seem to have uh, been talking, uh, I kind of overran part one, but we're just going to go right on to part two because I'm not done with uh, Hazel Coscalena and a teacher that affects eternity and has affected me for the last 55 years. Of course, I started college when I was very, very young, but that again is another story. But what I got from her was these experiences, one of which, which has led me to work on a project of a lifetime. One of the books that I was required to read, and I was always interested in Afro-Americans from the time that I called out my family for their racism about the Emmett Till case, which was a story about a young black man who was a year older than me, I was 11, who came down from Chicago to Mississippi and he whistled at a white woman and he was murdered. And my family seemed to think that that was a, a instrument of terror, was an instrument of social control. And I remember saying to them, well, Ma, I'm 11 years old and I whistle at white women all the time. That man was murdered. And I've just always had a lifetime feeling about that. One of the, the, one of the first story I wrote, uh, it, was, it was for the same English teacher, and it was called Brittingham Park. It was about a working class neighborhood on the near south side of Madison, not far from Pig Alley and Dark Alley, which was where my shanty Irish relatives lived when they came to work for the railroad in the early 1850s in Madison. But in this park, there was these activities going on, and one of them was there was a young Afro-American man, and I'll use those terms interchangeably, who could throw a football a mile. And I thought, well, maybe this is the same, this is the thing that will get him to another neighborhood, will get him part of the American dream, will get him through his skill, something will, will improve for him, just like it did for my Irish relatives. And we moved from being what they called at that time uh, uh, rafter Irish, then, uh, then shanty Irish rafter, where they have people in Ireland that were my ancestors that emigrated during the potato famine and they literally lived in the rafters of their house and they kept their animals on in the in the living room to keep the floor warm well we went from shanty and then finally at least curtain irish and that meant of course that uh, we were careful how much beer we beer bottles we put in our garbage and stuff but in any case she introduced me to this writer, this Afro-American writer, and I'm going to hold up a couple graphics of him. His name is Ralph Ellison, and he wrote a book called Invisible Man, which won the National Book Award in 1952, I believe. And when I worked for Professor, when I worked, did my term paper for Professor uh, Koshkalenum, I worked on the theme of the black man as a victim of his environment, seen by Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, who wrote Native Son, Ralph Ellison wrote Invisible Man, and a, uh, a black sociologist, Franklin Fraser from, Brown, from, from Howard University, who wrote, who wrote Black Bourgeoisie. And as a matter of fact, in 1992, towards the end of Ralph Ellison's life, after I had wrote the written the paper, written a pretty good kind of a journal article on Jack called Jack the Robot Sings the Blues, which you can see on my blog, my, my idea to do this kept alive and kept alive and alive. And I was in a situation where he was a guest at this national book event, and I was I was like a horse ridden hard and left out in the sun. And when I came in, I just stood there and I went over towards him and I certainly did not look respectable. 
I looked like a guy who was were old guy who was working hard, covered with sweat, and all I could do was shake hands with him and talk a little. And he was so kind to me. I have a project that my publisher has been waiting for, and I've been waiting for, and <coughs> I keep wanting to do it. Collecting an essays, a collection of essays on Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man as an important thing for the 21st, <coughs> the 21st century. And I think maybe working with Selena Duck, Selika Ducksworth, Professor David Jones, and McFarland Publishing with some of the new technologies of knowledge, I may well be talking two months from now, doing a call for papers as I get back to working on this essay collection. Because a wonderful thing about what he wrote about was he wrote about a black student who was trying to do the right thing, but every time he tried to do the right thing, the right thing was inaccessible to him. And when I was 18, I could realize, I could, I could understand that. I knew what that meant, he talked to me. I'm going to move a little bit more now to uh, EDI, Equity, diversion, Diversity and Inclusion. And I want to say that a friend of mine's daughter was looking for diversity friendly books because she didn't see herself in it. She didn't see herself in the children's books that were available so much. And that got me thinking about what I was like when I was a young person. And I didn't, I was dyslexic, but I didn't like children books because I was the cute little fat boy and I didn't see anybody like that except in something called Little Lulu comic books. The character was tubby and he was wicked smart and I even dressed like him but I couldn't read but one night I stayed up all night because I wanted to read the Little Lulu comic book because I was like tubby and I wanted to be like tubby. And I went from, even though I'm dyslexic, from the zero reading group to the first reading group. And by, not too many months later, I had the reading level of a college freshman because my brother took home his 10th grade Roman world history book. There was a picture of a Roman soldier. I wanted to read, the, read about how this guy, about, about the Roman Empire and whether or not the crest on his helmet was his real hair or it was just a crest. And I ended up, by the time I was 12, I read a very famous book by Gibbon called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Because I had an opportunity, because of where my father worked, in 1 West Wilson Street, in Madison, Wisconsin, to have the access to the entire state of Wisconsin lending library. And I would read the books and I would get to know more and more history. Of course, I was also an arrogant little fat boy. And I would correct my teachers. And they didn't necessarily take kindly to that. But that's another chapter and I think that will go for now. But I want to say that I am behind equity, diversity and inclusion. Because if you have white privilege like I obviously have, I'm not going to renounce it. It makes my privilege better because it allows me to interact with these wonderful young people.